Good morning and welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us for this morning session on mainstreaming ecopreneurs. Uh, we'll spend the next 45 minutes or so sort of defining what that means, talking about um, some of the innovations that we're seeing, particularly in the climate tech sector. And my name is Suzanne DiBianca. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Salesforce. And I'm joined today by an incredible uh, panel that I'll introduce uh, briefly, and then we'll get into the conversation. Um, so to my left is uh, the Honorable Prince Max of Liechtenstein, Chair of LGT and founder of LightRock. To his left uh, is Pullman Lowe, who is the, uh, is it the chair of the Royal Hotel Group? She, you have so many jobs I love when I was researching you. It's really incredible. But all connected to sustainability. All connected to sustainability. Also founder um, of the, the, the Alpha Trio Capital Fund um, and, and many more things I hope that you'll get into. Yeah. Uh, to her left is, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Rebecca, and um, Rebecca is an incredible entrepreneur out of the Netherlands who you'll hear her story of the incredible organization that she's founded working on nature restoration. And finally, um, to her left is um, uh, Professor Arun uh, Majumdur, who is the founding Dean of the Stanford School for Sustainability, the John Doerr School. It's been about a year in the making, I believe. Um, has an esteemed career in energy, um, working both for the US government and for Google for some period of time. So I think we cover sort of a vast range of expertise in this area. And I thought a good place uh, to start would be sort of a definition of ecopreneurship. Um, what does that mean? How are people operationalizing it uh, in their various roles? And Prince Max, I, I thought I'd start with you as someone who really kind of grew up in the traditional financial um, asset space at JP Morgan for many years and then at LGT. And I'm curious about the shift that you've made into impact investing and how you think of ecopreneurship. And I know LightRock is not specific to climate tech. It's one part of what you do. But I'd love to hear how you're thinking about it and what you're excited about. Um, well, I might be the wrong person to um, ask that question because when I read ecopreneurship, um, I think I probably read it for the first time. Um, so, <laughs> I, you know, um, so um, having said that, um, of course, um, I'm incredibly passionate um, uh, to address climate change um, and um, uh, the broader setup um, uh, for doing that um, uh, comes out of um, uh, LGT, um, uh, which is a private banking and asset management business where we manage about 350 billion in assets under management. Um, uh, and it's a 100% um, uh, sort of family owned um, uh, business. And at some point we decided to set up um, a philanthropic effort um, uh, that is called LGT Venture Philanthropy um, uh, that um, uh, in its initial sort of purpose um, uh, was um, uh, meant to invest capital um, uh, in um, organizations that create positive impact um, uh, on different dimensions, um, including um, uh, climate change. Um, uh, and we invested both in for-profit organizations, trying to be catalytic, um, uh, but also in non-for-profit organizations um, uh, and helping to scale them um, uh, having invested in the um, uh, for-profit organizations and having seen them um, uh, sort of develop quite nicely, and some of them we still have in our portfolio, um, uh, we decided to actually um, scale that um, effort um, uh, and establish a separate um, uh, platform, an uh, impact investing platform um, uh, that we have um, uh, branded um, uh, LightRock. Um, there we have sort of a broader fund that um, invests in sort of people, planet, productivity teams. But we have also um, uh, then seen the opportunity um, uh, to raise a, um, a dedicated climate fund. Um, and you know, um, 
how do we interact with entrepreneurs and how do I think about it? You know, if you want to be successful in private equity, it's all about um, sort of identifying um, uh, the right um, uh, sort of um, uh, business models um, uh, and investment and, and teams, management teams, um, uh, entrepreneurs often, but you know, just entrepreneur um, is sort of critical, but there need to be people who um, uh, can build teams. And um, uh, so for us, as we raised that climate fund, um, uh, what was critical is to develop a lot of domain expertise in key areas. And so one of the obvious ones um, has been battery um, uh, technology, mm -hmm. because electrification, of course, is sort of one key way um, uh, to decarbonize, um, uh, which is critical. And so, um, uh, so we have done a lot of deep dives um, uh, in that sector and looked at a, a lot of the um, opportunities and, um, uh, and, and if you then have seen a lot, done a lot of um, work in a sector, um, you um, hopefully um, will be able um, to connect um, uh, with the best entrepreneurs, impress them a little bit because you have deep know-how mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, then each um, uh, sort of organization, um, uh, or private equity organization, needs to find its um, uh, sort of, um, uh, I would say, um, a point of differentiation. Uh, and at Lightrock, you know, having formed um, only recently, um, uh, we have um, uh, taken the impact dimension um, into the very center of um, uh, what we're doing. Um, and I think that goes down well um, uh, with a lot of the young entrepreneurs. Um, but it's, of course, not sufficient um, uh, because you need to have all the traditional private equity skills. And so um, after having you know, um, uh, identified um, uh, the best opportunities, having the funnel set correctly, um, uh, and then hopefully negotiating a good um, uh, um, uh, sort of um, uh, investment, um, uh, it's then all about helping um, uh, those um, uh, entrepreneurs um, uh, to scale and be successful um, uh, with capital. Um, uh, but um, also um, uh, by um, uh, you know the network that you bring to the table, and there I think we're also quite differentiated um, uh, because we're a little bit broader, um, uh, and we have a, um, a sort of um, a strong presence also um, in the global south because we felt that capital um, uh, into Africa, into Latin America, um, into India um, uh, is going to be disproportionately more impactful. Um, uh, if successful, um, uh, then um, uh, in um, uh, Europe and the US, where the additionality of our efforts is probably not quite the same. So I stop here. Um, uh, and, and no, I think it's I think it's very good what you're saying, and um, I know these entrepreneurs really appreciate, in addition to the, the capital assets, uh, the human assets, the network assets. I think. You know, these are really important, whether, for example, you're working with battery companies um, or you're working with nature companies. I think it's been very interesting for me to see the, all the traditional um, investors who have gotten into this space in the last 10 years. And that's, you know, largely because we can, you know, do well by doing good, as they say. These are companies that are solving big problems, but also, you know, making good returns. Um, so really appreciate LGT you know, getting into this space in this way. And, and Pullman, I'll, I'll turn to you next, both with your hat um, in, uh, at, for Alpha Trio and the Climate Fund. I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. But also in your sort of day job, Royal Hotels Group, in the private sector, how do you think about um, you know, investing in these entrepreneurs slash ecopreneurs? Mm -hmm. and then bringing the private sector resources to help them scale. Sure. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, as a nature lover and a dog lover, I've always wanted to uh, embrace sustainability and purpose at the core of our corporate strategy. That's why we actually launched the first carbon neutral hotel in Hong Kong 13 years ago, kind of before ESG and sustainability became buzzwords. And 
we have actually proven that we can do well by doing good because iClub has done very well in the past 12 years. We have expanded to almost six um, properties in Hong Kong. And in the past decade, we have been investing in a number of impact uh, green tech ventures with actually great success. Uh, what's most encouraging is that we find that these ventures actually do well because of the impact they deliver rather than in spite of. Um, so contrary to public belief that there needs to be a trade-off, um, actually they are profitable precisely because they're helping us solve environmental challenges. And I'd say that, you know, actually sustainability is truly the defining um, challenge of the century, the greatest transition that we have to make in the history of mankind to, um, you know, uh, reduce our dependence on, on fossil fuel to completely do away with it. Um, but it can also be the greatest opportunity in that we are obviously the problem, but we can also be the solution by empowering those innovations that can help us with uh, the acceleration of this transition. And that's why I've um, established Alpha Trio Capital uh, with the mission to empower those disruptive solutions. And our thesis is very simple, that the next wave of unicorns ought to be green tech ventures that help us solve these existential challenges. Um, and we feel that you know, technology obviously is disrupting each and every facet of our lives, but they can also help us reduce emissions at scale um, across even the toughest sectors. That's why we are very excited, for example, about prop tech, about um, clean tech, and also agriculture and food tech. In Asia, um, again, we really are unfortunately lagging behind in terms of impact investing. Asia obviously is where the greatest growth is, but it's also accounting for two thirds of the emissions in the world. Um, of the total AUM dedicated to impact investing, we only account for 17%. And that's why I feel that we really uh, have to catch up. Um, there needs to be a sense of urgency in driving capital into this impact space. And that's why I've established Alpha Trio Capital as an impact partner for a lot of the startups so that we can help them with their ESG strategy to help them measure their impact and outcomes. Um, and also we are the commercial partner because you know, um, with our hotel operations and also our other partners in the fund, we provide an ecosystem for them to really test their solutions, to fine tune their business model and connect them with all the resources and connections they need to scale and become unicorns. Um, so I think really we need to, to collaborate because they don't need just capital, they need resources, they need our network. Um, and thirdly, we are the Asian partner because actually, especially in this part of the world, there are a lot of very cutting edge inventions and yet the local market um, probably is not as large as it is in Asia. Um, so that's why we want to really help to facilitate um, technology exchange and knowledge transfer by being their Asian partner to help them build the local team, to be, you know, to build local JVs and to penetrate through Asia. Mm. So 17% um, moving the needle up into the 20s, I think is a... Well, hopefully more. I mean, if we account more. for two-thirds of the emissions, <laughs> right. we ought to be. <laughs> and certainly, if you look at the, the world population, um, yes. I think that's a, it's a... And a lot of innovation is coming out of that part of the world as well. So thank you for your leadership there. And Rebecca, I'll come back to you in a, a second, but I want to um, get a sense... Arun, from your perspective in academia, but you've also been an operator, one thing that um, I'm, we've heard the word scale uh, a number of times. I've heard you say that, you know, it's easy to start up, but scale up is very different. And I, um, I really like what I've heard about how you're thinking about this school for sustainability in the context of kind of a cross-disciplinary approach. Um, an accelerator approach. And so I'm interested to maybe have you uh, tell folks here a little bit more about that and what you're learning about both the need for cross-disciplinary knowledge and expertise, but also in the context of being able to scale. Well, first of all, thanks to the Economic Forum to bring us all together. And, and also thanks to Mark for his leadership on this ecopreneurship. And we have with a supported launch to program at, between GSB, the Graduate School of Business, and the Door School on Ecopreneurship. But let me, since you asked, let me sort of step back and talk about the 
the scale of the challenge, right? And Pullman referred to that. You got a $100 trillion economy, global economy, 8 billion people going to 10 by mid-century. And we need to shift that whole economy, which is largely based on fossil fuels. We need to shift the whole economy in the next 20 to 30 years. Something that got built up over 150 years, right? That's the magnitude of the challenge, right? So we need solutions. And the solutions have to be cheaper, better, faster, right? We went from, if you look at some of the pictures in New York City in the early 1900s, we went from horse carriages to cars because the poop from the horse carriages was an environmental problem. And you came to cheaper, better, faster, right? And the same thing needs to happen. Now, if you look at what solutions we have today, solar wind batteries, the first lithium ion battery commercial came out in the early 90s. It took 30 years to scale that to where we are today, and now we can think about electric vehicles. Same thing with solar, it took even longer. And wind even took even longer, right? Windmills have been around for a long time, but not at this scale, right? So if you think about what solutions are needed to transition the whole economy, there's much more. Like, how do we make zero carbon steel, cement? If you don't do that, we're not gonna solve the problem. Mm. Food is 25% of the global emissions. We gotta decarbonize that, right? So you think about each of these threads, and we did the numbers. If you do the numbers, just take grid scale storage. We know all, we, we need that. It's a trillion dollar per year uh, sector. So there are, you take lithium ion batteries, that's a trillion dollar. You take food, that's multi-trillion dollar. So it's, if you are to solve this problem, we are at the cusp of launching, the world is cusp of launching multiple trillion dollar businesses in the future, right? This is where, this is the time. So if you're an entrepreneur and, or ecopreneur trying to help the transition, this is the best time to be around. In fact, I wish I was a graduate student right now or an undergraduate because the opportunity is amazing. Yeah. Mm. And we can make commitments, right? The COP28, we want to transition away from fossil fuel. I love that. But we're not going to be able to transition unless we have solutions. That's right. And the solutions have to be cheaper and better and faster, right? So that is the opportunity. And one of the things that most academic institutions are fairly good at is to get startups. But, and, and in our ecosystem, you know, Stanford has a history of doing that. And we do that every year, at least 30, 40 startups that come out. But we're also realizing that this is not software, yeah. right? This is different. If you're going to solve this problem, you could be a social entrepreneur or a commercial entrepreneur. This will, there's an economic issue, there's a cost, there's steel cement on the ground. And so, Thinking about scale from the beginning, I think is a very important factor. Otherwise, you, it's not just a go-to-market strategy. Mm -hmm. It is go-to-market and scale in the next 10 years. How do we do that? Which means if you think about any business or any entity at scale, economy-wide or global scale, you have to worry about what are the supply chains? What are the policy barriers, policy levers? What are the markets if there's? How many people do you touch, right? Is there public acceptance? Are there ethical issues? Are there unintended consequences that come out of this? Because we are living in the unintended consequence of the 20th century, right? So we have to look at that comprehensively. And this is not just an engineering or a business school or law school. This is the holistic view of thinking about new entrepreneurial activities that not only takes it out of Stanford or any other academic institution, but, and, and innovations coming out, but takes it to scale so that you have a roadmap ahead. That's what we're trying to do. That's brilliant. And i um, interested to hear more about some of the companies that you're working with, some of what you've learned in the last year. And I think um, before that, I'll, we'll move to an actual ecopreneur, um, Rebecca Brassier, and I'm sorry I blanked on your name as we were sitting down, as we were walking together in the cold coming here, um, uh, who runs uh, an incredible organization called Land Life and has, and has done a really nice job, I think, in this context of scale over the last 10 years. 
So um, can you tell, tell us a little bit about the company and about what you've learned? Sure, yeah. So um, we restore nature, and on some level, we believe that we are creating the most valuable product in the world. Um, you know, half the world's uh, GDP depends on nature. And then probably the other half depends on that half that depends on nature. So it is, it is part of our life and is part of our economy. And to Arun's point, it's a hardware business. Uh, restoring nature is a hardware business. We use software, we develop software to make our job easier on the ground. Because everything that we do is to focus on the scale, quality, and efficiency of nature restoration. We simply don't have time. The challenge is very big with two billion hectares of degraded land. Um, and we are creating a product that is still, unfortunately, dwindling in supply. Um, so we have to be very creative with both our software and our hardware solutions to, to get the job done. So our software uh, tells us where to plant. You know, with all the innovation in remote sensing, we can easily parse out land parcels that have both the economic and ecological potential for reforestation. Uh, we've developed uh, clustering algorithms that tell us these are similar planting conditions and locations, which helps us derive the species mix, uh, the species density. And this we can do from behind our desk, and it makes our job f uh, faster um, and more focused, because the real hard work is on the ground. And I think that one thing we all need to remember is that we're not going to solve the climate crisis from behind our computers. It is going to ultimately lead to action on the ground. And the investments in technology are so important because the real challenge is getting landowners on board, working with the nurseries that are you know, multi-generation mom and pop shops um, that are not remotely ready for the scale that's gonna be required to restore what we have lost and will continue to lose as we make this transition because economy by nature is, is extractive. So we have to find a way to replenish it even through this transition. Uh, the energy transition alone won't solve our biodiversity crisis and our nature loss. Um, so everything that we focus on is about that scale question. Um, and how do we move from 100 hectares to thousands of hectares to tens of thousands of hectares? And a lot of that can be done through technology, but a lot is also through the convening power of organizations like this and thinking about we have to take a landscape level approach to how we design nature restoration. Well, that sounds great in theory, but a landscape level approach means you're, you're crossing multiple different landowners with multiple different land uses, and you're trying to explain to them how this organism needs to traverse across properties because it ultimately benefits our economy. That is very abstract, and that is very hard to communicate to landowners. And so it is that effort that is going to be hyper-local but needs to be at scale in order for us to continue to make this transition and survive all of these changes that are happening in our different biomes. And you know, putting people at the center um, is really critical, I think, as we think about all of these solutions. And as you and I were walking over and talking about having to baseline projects yeah. <laughs> and saying what that means is you have to go to the, you know, the, the neighboring farm next door and sort of explain um, you know, what you're doing, people are not always friendly, don't always sort of understand. And um, so I think putting people at the heart of it is, is really key. Um, you talked a little bit about collaboration. I know you're here with Uplink. Yep. I'm a big fan and supporter of Uplink. Um, just before we move on, I, I was hoping you could describe what Uplink is um, yeah. and what its value it's provided to you as it relates to sort of network and people. Absolutely. Um, so Uplink is a program sponsored by the World Economic Forum as well as Salesforce and Deloitte. Um, and it finds uh, ecopreneurs or new entrepreneurs in what they believe will be the new economy. Um, and that's where I think, you know, in, uh, in 15 to 20 years, to your point, it won't have a special title around ecopreneurs. We are going to be mainstream op entrepreneurs because we are creating the new jobs. Uh, we are creating the solutions at scale to address some of the world's biggest challenges. And I think that the forum has had insight into that and in how do we integrate businesses at a much earlier stage, such as, such as mine, uh, into these types of dialogues and conversations because this is the future of the economy. Um, and so we represent, uh, we're here representing 10 different pillars. So I'm here representing nature, but I also have colleagues here representing oceans, uh, 
uh, urban uh, transformation, water use, uh, kind of agriculture, precision agriculture. Um, and they have brought us together from across the globe to also exchange our own ideas as a community of uh, entrepreneurs in the new economy, and then to connect us on forums such as this. It's a real privilege, um, and it's a, great, uh, it's a great exchange of ideas between um, sort of new, new companies and, and institutional players. Well, thank you, and thank you for representing Uplink. Thank you for doing it so well and um, for the incredible impact that you've had. Uh, Prince Bax, I'll, I'll come back to you in terms of, um, you know, there's been a lot of challenges in the state of the world in the last, you know, 12 months, one of which has been the carbon markets, of which you work very deeply in, Rebecca. Oh. Um, uh, and I know Light Rock um, has been thinking a lot about this space, as, you know, have, have Arum and you and Pullman, maybe you as well. I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of the moment that we're in, both in terms of the challenges and the opportunities um, that are gonna come as a result of the turbulence that we're seeing today. Sure. So, um, you know, thinking about um, sort of the carbon markets, I, I think that the, um, what it tries to accomplish is to um, integrate the externalities, the positive and the negative ones um, into um, uh, the economy and into business models um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and thereby um, uh, sort of lead to um, a better um, asset allocation, right? That's sort of the overall um, objective. Um, and um, uh, clearly, you know, that objective is spot on and incredibly important. Um, and if that would have um, uh, sort of been established earlier um, uh, and um, uh, we would have um, uh, sort of found um, uh, the right systems, um, uh, we would all be in a much, much better place. Um, uh, so um, uh, we are still in the process of optimizing um, uh, this um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, this, this carbon um, uh, schemes. Um, and there are different ones. Um, uh, they're the ones um, uh, that um, uh, try to address um, uh, the, um, uh, the emissions and to reduce those. Um, uh, and they're incredibly important because hopefully they will overall um, uh, sort of bring down um, uh, the emissions by putting a, a price um, on emissions and on carbon or a cost. Um, I think those are now fairly well um, established. There's quite a bit of experience and they're scaling quite nicely um, around the globe. Um, you can also invest with, um, in those um, markets, which um, we are doing. Um, it's a, actually a nice little side asset, niche asset class that generates good uncorrelated returns. Um, I'm quite happy this year making um, a sort of above 10% um, on, um, on one external investor um, that is doing that. Um, and the other one, um, which is the the more challenged one um, is the um, voluntary um, carbon market um, uh, segment, um, which tries to basically give um, rewards um, for um, mainly um, uh, sort of um, uh, um, reducing um, uh, the um, or protecting um, our um, natural carbon sinks um, and. Uh, that, um, uh, such as um, uh, protecting our, um, uh, our um, uh, sort of forests, um, our um, uh, natural ecosystems, you know, that type of um, uh, sort of positive work has not gotten the um, uh, economic rewards um, uh, that it should have deserved. Um, and um, if we get these right, um, uh, it will also be incredibly important because in order to fight climate change successfully, um, uh, we need to accomplish two things, right? Um, uh, we need to decarbonize um, on one hand, um, uh, but we also need to, um, uh, to protect um, our natural um, uh, carbon sinks, um, uh, which are mainly the most vibrant ecosystems um, uh, that we have out there, um, uh, the rainforest and so on. Um, and, you know, um, uh, there, um, uh, uh, we are jointly um, on the board um, of South Pole, which is um, a company that has been a pioneer in that field. Mm -hmm. 
um, that has faced some challenges that are not just Southport challenges, um, uh, but they're actually broader um, uh, sort of um, market mechanism um, uh, challenges um, uh, that we will need to address. And hopefully sooner rather than later, I'm confident that we will get there um, uh, because we have to. Um, uh, but um, urgency um, uh, is... Um, of course, incredibly high um, around climate change, and that's what, I guess, brings us all together here. That's right, and I think that uh, I'm ho hopeful that on the other side of this will become better standards, higher quality of projects, um, and to your point earlier, Rebecca, I mean, we're not only in a climate uh, crisis, we're also in a biodiversity crisis, so we can't back off on investing in nature. Um, it's too important for the, our, the, the fragile planet that we live on in, in so many areas. Um, I just want to uh, check to see, am, am, are, we, are we doing a Q&A at the end of this? Should I be holding a little bit of time for that? Okay, well, well is that a yes? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I'll just ask maybe one more question and, and come back. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and, uh, uh, Pullman, kind of go to you around um, AI. So, you know, we're seeing that everywhere this year at, at Davos. That it is, It's the theme. There is a lot of innovation happening in this area. Uh, we've been investing in some entrepreneurs that are, um, that are working on AI solutions as it relates to uh, the climate crisis. And for for yourself and also for you, Arun, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're seeing in this space um, and what you're excited about and, and also, you know, what you see the challenges might be. And Fritz Max, Rebecca, feel free to weigh in on the AI question as well. Sure, maybe I can just go quickly. Um, so, you know, to Aaron's point, we really have to do this quickly. Otherwise, we are simply running out of time. And luckily, we can harness on the power of AI. Um, so, for example, in the prop tech sector, um, smart energy so saving solutions, um, smart building management systems can really help optimize the use of energy um, in, in buildings. So in Asia, because of the weather, um, buildings can account up to 50% of emissions um, because we have to turn on the aircon all the time. Um, but because of AI, we can really precisely use energy to the best extent um, and also save on con air conditioning, save on um, everything. Uh, and in terms of uh, clean tech, that can also help optimize the use of renewable energy and also precision farming. So to this day, there are still 9 million people dying of hunger. Um, but and also because of biodiversity loss and climate change, you know, our food supply is becoming more and more jeopardized. So as the world population soars to you know, 10 billion, we simply have to grow more food by at least maybe 60%. Um, luckily, again, we can leverage on AI. Um, so we've been investing in precision farming solutions and also alternative protein to uh, feed the world without all the emissions. So through AI, we can basically grow more food um, up to 30% um, with the use of less resources like energy and water um, because we can integrate all the field data with satellite with weather data so that we don't have to use as much water. Yeah. So you're seeing innovation <coughs> many places, one of which is the food and agriculture sector in particular. Can you just talk a little before we hear from you, Aaron, um, I read about the work that you've been doing with the metaverse, and you talked about a carbon neutral hotel. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very interesting use of AI, in my view. So I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about what that is, why it's important, um, and how it really educates your customers in um, you know, thinking about how and where right. they're staying as they travel. So I feel that a lot of times at forums like these, we are focused more on the extrinsic motivational factors. So we are trying to foster um, you know, private-public partnerships to create these incentives to do good. Right? Or there are lots of regulations um, that, uh, for the ESG reporting, et cetera. Um, but ultimately, we have to get to the root of the problem. And that is actually overconsumption and also lack of appreciation of the interconnectedness of all. Which is why I feel that actually the ultimate root of the problem can only be 
can only be addressed by changing behavior. And what it takes is, again, to appreciate the fact that we are all in this together. And that's why, for example, in our hotel rooms, we have um, some nudges to encourage our guests to forego, say, towel, to forego housekeeping, and also the use of plastic bottles. And for plastic bottles, I, I thought it is an interesting piece of data to change. Before we started using water filtration systems, our hotels alone in Hong Kong, we have 12 hotels, we actually consumed over 3 million plastic bottles mm -hmm. a year. But because of a, a, a water disinfection a technology from Stanford by Professor Yi Choi, we are able to use that groundbreaking technology to disinfect, disinfect water at cost and also switch over to water filtration. So we have actually saved on a lot of carbon emissions that way. And also by in giving the incentives to our consumers and also educating them about you know, the externalities of all, all these users, all, all the um, non-eco-friendly choices, we can actually foster long-term behavioral change. And I think that is the key to the, to the transition. I, um, I would like to support um, uh, the point that um, uh, you know, value systems, cultures, I would say culture, value system, and then that translates into behavioral patterns um, uh, that we um, either don't want to see anymore um, or um, uh, that we want to support. You know, that team um, has been grossly underestimated, um, uh, and I think it's a root cause of a lot of the problems. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I come from a sort of small country and from a family that has been both um, uh, sort of a tradition um, in politics um, uh, and um, in business. I think culture um, and values and behavioral characteristics um, you know, can be driven um, at, starts at the family level, typically, right? Um, uh, hopefully, um, uh, you sort of get a lot of the, that um, uh, sort of right um, uh, from the beginning. Um, uh, then you go through school, <coughs> and you should, that should, that's where you should get reinforced as well. Then hopefully, um, uh, you work at the business um, uh, that, again, um, uh, sort of doesn't tolerate um, uh, the bad behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, make sure that um, uh, yeah, there are no plastic <laughs> bottles. Um, I mean, here in Switzerland, the notion um, uh, that um, uh, you know, um, still water is being sold in plastic bottles is, is totally ridiculous. I mean, the water that you get from the tap for free is just you know, hundred times better. Um, uh, and any um, uh, plastic bottle, um, uh, plastic bottled water in Switzerland should be to not tolerated, right? Um, uh, and but so again, um, uh, so culture at the at the corporate level, a huge opportunity, and you know LGT has done pretty well um, over the last um, uh, sort of decades. One of the key success factors, I'm firmly convinced, excellent culture, mm. huge differentiating factor. And even at the state level, um, and you know, if I think about different countries um, and how I would sort of define the culture, um, it's just incredibly important. I mean, the culture in the US over the last 40 years, I've been going to the US now for a very, very long time, it has just shifted mm. dramatically. Um, and you know, there are a number of reasons for that. But you know, it can deteriorate but it can also reverse. Um, so I think um, you know, we need to do the right things from a business perspective um, and you know, sort of investing and so on. But um, coming back to your point, I think culture mm. is one where we need to work at much, much harder and much more consciously. I agree. And Arun, I'm going to give it to you for the, for the last word. And, um, but what I will say is a, a fun fact on, on Pullman as I was doing some research is you, you have a master's in Buddhist studies, yes. don't you? <laughs> and I can see that come through, uh, the way that you approach your work. And so I really appreciate that and thinking about how do we take it from the extrinsic to the intrinsic, um, behavior change being core part of that, culture being core part of that, engaging people being core part of that. So we'll leave a few minutes for questions, but. 
Um, Arun, anything that you want to add? Anything around AI? Anything that relates to culture of this last bit Very of Very quickly, I'll give you two examples. One is that with AI, I think it's fair to say that we are going to have some kind of a personal assistant of some kind that knows you and can help you do things, right? I think that's coming. Yeah. It's already almost there. Yeah. So if that's the case, one of the things we are looking at, we have, in fact, in our new school, the whole department and a thread of environmental behavioral science. Mm. Mm -hmm. And with faculty from the business school, from other parts of the school, all joining the door school. And one of the things we are looking at and talking about culture, indigenous cultures, people who live on islands, they had to be sustainable. Otherwise, they had to leave the island, <laughs> right? We are on a Earth as an island, mm -hmm. right? So, and Buddhism or other religious, multi-religion. In fact, we are hosting a, a multi-religious faith meeting in February. Mm. And, and to see how, what are the lessons learned from those cultures, and that can be embedded in your personal agent mm. that could help you and nudge you the right way. This is something that we'll be looking at. Um, the other thing, going back to carbon markets, we all talk about net zero. Right? What does net zero mean? This, this, we have to suck it out somewhere. If you want to have financial transaction out there, there needs to be assurance. There needs to be certainty um, or known uncertainty in what you do. So what we have now are the technology, like for example in the private sector, Planet Labs, that they're scanning the Earth in hyperspectral imaging mm -hmm. on a daily basis, right? Now, we have chat GPT for language. Right? So large language model, essentially we have the data for every text that humans have ever written already built in to our large language models. We don't have that for images yet. And I think what we are going to see is taking those images and looking at with precision, where is the, the kind of things agriculture can do? What are the kind, where is the carbon? And it's not just the where it is carbon today. If there's a wildfire or some other disease, the carbon goes away. And we have to keep stock of that on a regular basis so that we can enable a carbon market. And I think we're going to see AI um, being driven towards those where you don't have to have the knowledge base of how to program in Python to be able to get to that. But you should be able to do what you're doing for language. You should be able to do for images. Yes. And I think that interface uh, is going to be developed so that you can just query images and say, okay, tell me where the, all the eucalyptus trees are around the world and what's the height. And you should be able to get that answer from satellite imagery without being able to program. And I think that's coming. And I think that's the future that, and in carbon markets and biodiversity and more. I think that's, it's very exciting. I, I agree and I, I think that, you know, there's nothing that builds trust like transparency. And so this is our opportunity um, and able to do that with imaging and, and others. Um, in the few minutes we have left, questions, please? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for the amazing insight uh, to the speakers. My name is Nicholas. I'm part of the Global Shapers community from the World Economic Forum, representing the Dar es Salaam Hub. It's quite interesting when you talked about scaling up, right? And my perspective is that scaling up is really context driven right, and has proved to be a challenge. So is there a strategy or insights that you can give us or a success story that has helped to scale up different entrepreneurial uh, initiatives across borders um, in different contexts? Thank you. Yeah, you know, from my experience, I'm a sort of scaling up I'm a, is a challenge that differs I'm a, sort of from business model and activity to activity, right? I'm a, yes, I'm a sort of capital I'm a, can be a constraint, and, 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 I'm a, and especially if the volatility of the capital markets a, is as significant as we have seen it over the last couple of years, that's not helpful, right? I'm a, but I, I, I do think that um, 
sort of capitalist key, um, and um, then um, the other sort of aspect about scaling is um, just building strong um, execution capability. Um, that's and, and that again comes from um, building strong management teams um, and. Um, and, and for entrepreneurs, what is very hard, I find, um, coming back a little bit to the values, is you know you need to um, you know you start um, small and humble, um, and you don't have access to the best people, um, and then um, uh, you know you sort of get more capital, um, and you become more successful, um, and you have had your um, sort of loyal bodies um, from. Um, uh, the first um, uh, moment. Um, but when you have um, uh, grown to the next level, um, uh, you need to be dedicated to the broader overall mission, uh, and you need to bring in um, uh, the better people. And those sometimes then, you know, the CFO for um, a business that has um, uh, sort of 20 million revenues, um, uh, it's going to be different, um, uh, most likely, than the CFO that um, has been around at the very beginning. And these changes um, are really tough um, uh, because they're often in contradiction with other. Um, uh, so that's where um, uh, sort of good boards, good investment, um, co or good coaching um, uh, can help the entrepreneurs um, uh, to make these moves. The best entrepreneurs do it quite well themselves. Um, uh, but it's scaling comes down to availability of capital um, and, um, uh, and and um, uh, building um, uh, increasingly strong teams that have strong and strong execution power, and then partly, and that's where you know the difference um, uh, is between the software um, uh, models and the hardware, and a lot of the decarbonization is going to be hardware, and a lot of the you know as it, as it was already pointed out. And that is just, you know, you go through learning curves. Um, and there is no, you know, there's, you can try to go through them faster. Um, and that's what all good entrepreneurs try to do. But there's always going to be a learning curve. Um, and things build on each other and so on. So there we just should have started a little earlier. Um, <laughs> we try to sort of be as fast as possible, but you know that's just going to take time. I think it's also the intrinsic belief that you have as yourself that the amount of effort, time, and resources that you are doing to do something small is the exact same amount of time and effort and resources to do something <laughs> big. And if you keep that at the forefront of your mission, of your operations, of your growth and learning curve, that helps you get to scale because it actually it's the same it's the same heartache it's the same sweat blood and tears for something small as it is for something big and so you have to keep that at the forefront of your teams and operations i like that yeah thank you and i'm i'm glad as a as an operator on the panel that you were able to sort of have the the last word on that because <laughs> <laughs> um sadly we're out of time and i don't think we can go um any further but Certainly, I'm available uh, after the session for any follow-up questions. And I really want to thank the panel for your perspective, um, for your wisdom and your insight, and to all of you for joining us this morning. Enjoy your week. Thank you. Thank you.